It's been one year since the unfortunate and overwhelming attacks of September 11, 2001. Presently, the United States continues to discuss the escalation of war, while daily anti-terrorist laws threaten the very freedoms of the United States citizens. During these times of war and strife, the conscious hip-hop community is concerned with establishing itself as a vehicle for peace and prosperity. We have put forth a document called the Hip Hop Declaration of Peace, which we'll get into a little later on. This declaration came through the United Nations when we went to the United Nations in, in uh, 2001, May 16th, 2001, we went to the United Nations and announced hip hop as an international culture, legally, Hip-hop is a culture. We sincerely thank you for attending this conference, this hip-hop conference entitled An Eye on Terror. And notice the eye, meaning individual views on terror. Discussing hip-hop's responsibility toward the prevention of terror, we have gathered here today to establish advice and protection for the existence and development of our hip-hop community. As you can see, we're filming this, we're recording it as well. And we're doing this because after this event is over, we're sending this information out all over the world. We're sending it to governments, we're sending it to schools, we're sending it to religious organizations, we're sending it to community organizations as well, so that they can see that what they see on television and radio regarding hip-hop is not the truth. What the truth is, is here, right now. This is the truth. Hip-hop, what you see of it on television and on radio, are well-performed acts for people to get money. And we don't knock them for that. What the issue is, is balance. Balance. We have no problem with women who would like to be on television in thongs and scantily dressed. But we'd like to see a little more of the other woman, the working class woman, the mother, the grandmother, the sister, the wife. We have no problem with men that jump on the television and act like they're not fathers, act like they have no responsibilities, basically want to thug it out and lead our children to prison. We even don't have a problem with that. There's a need for rebellion in youth life. But if you never show the other man, the minister, the thinker, the philosopher, the father, the son, the brother, if we never get to see that person, then we raise our children basically in an imbalanced mentality, which leads to the stress and the strife of their lives. So again, we thank you all for coming out here today to participate with us in creating this balance in hip hop. No longer can people say hip hop is just about guns and hoes and thugs and bitches. Can't say that no more. You could say, well, that's part of the story. But that's not the whole story. Today you're getting the other side of the story. We don't claim to be the all of hip hop either. But we do claim to be that other side that balances what you get and you see every day on television and radio. So here we are now in 2002 trying to take a look at what hip hop could look like in 2023, what could it actually look like? To help us with this discussion, I'm going to bring up a young lady who is going to discuss 9-11 and youth development in hip-hop culture. And I want you to listen to what she has to say. The people you see coming up here Today, they took their time to be here as well. 
keep in mind that everyone had to travel and so on. And I specifically picked these speakers personally because when I spoke to them, I thought, in my mind, they had something that you need to hear. They have perspectives that you need to hear and know about. I'd like to introduce to you Ms. Nicole Hodges. Hi, my name's Nicole Hodges. I'd like to welcome you all here today. Thank you. Your time as has been beautifully illustrated, you know, through Janine and KRS is really respected because you could be anywhere. So I wanted to reinforce that point. And I'd like to really thank the Temple of Hip Hop for having me here today. In your brochures, they talk about 9-11 and youth development. But before I really go into what youth development is and what I mean by that, I wanted to start with why I, I told KRS-One and Janine and everyone at Temple why I wanted to address youth issues because I feel that where we are right now, the youth perspective, youth voices have been ignored and not brought to the forefront of how we can help our youth deal with trauma and tragedy. And so I started to think as a performer, I'm a performer and playwright, and I'm also an academic. And when 9-11 for me, if I look back to my life at 9-11 on 2001 and where I was, like all of you, I was upset, I was frustrated, I was angry, and I was confused. And that was on day one. But by day two, I started to see some things that really disturbed me and really started to put me Nicole Hodges, within the context of what happened, and I was here in Los Angeles. Because the profiles that came up of what America meant to me when I started to see the flags, when I started to see the level of patriotism that came, I wanted to participate, and I wanted to feel that for my flag. But for me, it reminded me that as much as that flag meant that we could stand in this situation, it also meant for me, it reminded me that I was an outsider, because as an African-American woman and as a woman whose grandfather came here who was of Arab descent, who was Algerian, came to this country for the freedoms that we're enjoying here today, it made me start to question my position and my positionality and how, how did I translate those feelings and emotions. And that's when I started to think about my youth, the youth in my community, and how I could help them if I was having trouble a person who's had these opportunities to travel, to study. How are our youth dealing with this? I started to question things. So one of the things that I wanted to share with you were some youth voices in Los Angeles community that could kind of set the tone for how hip-hop and my particular area of arts, which is theater, can be used as a laboratory for us to help youth really deal with their feelings and emotions that are coming out of these events. One of our youth says, this surreal turn of events has left me pondering life and its value. What kind of person would willingly kill thousands of people while sacrificing themselves as well? What kind of people are out there that are so willing to kill the innocent just to get a point across? Such questions make me afraid of what's waiting for me outside my apartment door. That is from Laura Spaulding. She's 16, and she's from the Los Angeles Center for Enriched Studies. Another youth told me, being an immigrant living in the city with the second largest population and going to a high school in downtown, I felt scared. Trying to imagine how many lives were lost and being grateful I'm back home. Two months ago, I was on the East Coast in New Jersey and Philadelphia. Chatting with my friend that lives in D.C., she told me, a lot of my friend's parents died today. Now I see life in a new way. We're not controlling our lives, but our higher forces. And that's from Mariana Zamboni, and she goes to Belmont High School. So within these contexts, you see that youth are examining their place in the world and their space. And not only do they examine their space in the place, they examine their race. And in that race, they examine their ethnicity and their nationality and their Americanness. So for me, as a person who works in theater and examines race and culture on a daily basis, I'm a PhD student at USC and American Studies and Ethnicity, I have to look at our youth in the context of this situation. And so for me, theater is a way that we can isolate a particular incident and we can help youth engage and show them how that they can deal with circumstances and give them the vocabulary to reach out to one another to understand difference. 
they can write their own narratives and they don't have to receive the things that the, need, the media are giving them about who they are in this particular situation, about how they should react. As Karis One was illustrating, he was saying, we are not just that, we are many things. There are many amazing responses that our youth have to talk about this event, but we need to help them with the language to be able to articulate their emotions and their feelings about dealing with these images that they're seeing, racialized images of Arab Americans who are being profiled and being held Someone needs to explain that to them. Why is that? I mean, I'm African American of North and West African descent. What does that look like? What does terror look like? So the theater can help us guide youth by using their voices, by defining their voices. We can help them write it. We can guide them with literature. We can guide them with our voices. Thank you. Well, now we're, we're hoping that this war will spread beyond uh, the current state that uh, it is. Baghdad Radio says Saddam Hussein braved Allied bombs to visit his troops in Kuwait. The Allies are hitting elite Iraqi troops with all their power. Or is it with George Bush, who says he loved peace, has led the nation into war? Why are we in this Why war? Are we in this war? 1991 has begun, and money's 21 now. I don't know somehow picking up a gun now. Loaded with gunpowder, fighting for the systems wrong. The blacks down now before we used to diss them. Of this nation, we make up 12%. The front line seems to misrepresent. Cause I hear that they're working more than 30% of color there. Fighting for some oil, but you think we'll ever get a share? So don't gas me to go and get gas in the worst way. I'm the first to say pass, G. And don't think that you're taking me by sending me a draft card. Oh, you're making me laugh hard. So rant and rave, cause I know you say we got to, but I ain't just Slave. Plus, my papa told me not to. And the voice of a panther is much stronger than that of a paper tiger. Somebody give me a lighter so I can set you aflame. You ought to be ashamed, dominating for greed, using my name. The underground ain't with it. Don't be alarmed. Just bring my people back to warm arms. Time for peace. Peace. There's just nothing there for another American soldier to die for. And we cannot go around being the world's policemen. We have a lot of problems here at home. Yeah, they're gonna stand that firm. P-Dog is finna get warm and blow the whistle on the devil Cause devils wanna kill us all So hear the plea and please heed the final call And sweat as a black silhouette came forth to spark war in minds of young brains And up the peace when police are beating down Anybody close to dark shades of brown And like I said, the devil made me break the grip of shame Cause I'm pained and I'm made to be thinking of a master plan To help save the original Asiatic earthborn man slave Make way for P-Dog the bush killer, cop killer a black urban gorilla because without justice I'll bust until it's released and only then is the time for peace yo Ted, Ted, Ted give him a break The world that we live in Where no one gives a damn about the future of children Just building a cash flow Making a bank account Let us expose the truth Is that what the war's about? Cause I don't understand But what kind of a man Should have to sacrifice his life For an area of sand All the turmoils Making my blood boil Cause I don't wanna see our people dying for oil See the so-called media Sway don't believe in ya The way I'm receiving ya It seems you're deceiving the mass majority Although I'm no authority America's army is made of mostly minorities So I wanna see and hear all the Soldiers of color, although all of us suffer, we're only here in the others. Well, here's my perspective, and I'm surely convinced I can never help a system that's been fighting against my race. Liberate Kuwait, well, here's the fact that you couldn't do the same when it was South Africa. So much corruption, nothing but total destruction has set it. It seems we're heading for Armageddon. So pray every day, every man of every faith, whether American, Arabian, we're all the human race. And maybe if we educate, the ignorance will cease. Listen when I tell you, brothers, it's time for peace. Yo, yo, 
check this out. This is Humpty Hump in the house, and I got a little something to say about this too. Understand me? And I think it's real cool. All these people are protesting against the war and protesting it's against time for peace. peace. Protesting, you know, for peace and everything. But yo, when the war's over, where y'all at? Because every day people are dying. Every day people are dying from AIDS. From crime, from crime in the streets, oh, from yeah. all kinds of things. Yo, I'm talking yo, about minorities and not yo. being treated right around the world. Yo, yo, There's yo. a war. What's up, man? What's up? Man, let's go, man. I'm not finished, though, God. Come on, man. Yo, come on, please, man. I just don't feel like this is right. If people are trying to, trying to say that this is, is this the first time people are dying? People been dying, yo. man. They've been dying. Uh, this woman I'd like to bring up. She belongs to, well, not only belongs, she runs the Rock the Vote organization. And I bring this up because, I bring this up because I, you know, those of you that know my music or know even some of my political stances will recall a time when, <clears throat> you know, I'm not one for the voting process, or oh, I wasn't one. Uh, to be, you know, involved in the voting process, advocating the voting process, uh, trying to tell you uh, that you should be engaged in the voting process. Um, I'm on record actually uh, saying that, you know, the, the, the voting process is not the way to change this country. But I've changed. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I really want to be honest with you here is that it wasn't an easy change for me either. Uh, and I would say that it's, it's not even really a change. It's sort of a balancing even in my own life where I realize that even though I may advocate, I, I may say, well, we need more voter education than voter registration. Or we need to rely upon God and our spiritual power as opposed to a president and our political power. These are things that I believe, and I still believe them. But I wonder what would happen if hip-hop as a culture, as a unified group of people, as a specific kind of people in the United States did vote. What would be the change in that? As I look at the voting process and I look at how cities and towns are affected by the voting process, I also look at, you know, I don't know if I like this street named uh, Hollywood Boulevard. That doesn't relate to me. I don't know what that is. I may want to name it Africa Bambata Road. <laughs> I may want to call it Breaking Avenue, DJ and Street. But the only way that it's ensured that it's going to happen now, right now, tangible right here in our face, is if a group of people that want Breaking Street get together and vote for it. So my view then became balanced in this regard. No, I'm not giving up my view of the corruption behind the voting process, well, the way this country has turned voting into a farce. But who is the country if it is not us? I would love to see a hip-hop president one day. I'd love to see a hip-hop mayor one day. And when I say a hip-hop mayor, meaning like, you know, someone who grew up with a P.E. album. Oh, for those that don't know, a Public Enemy album. <laughs> uh, I, I'd like to go, I would go to the voting booth and vote for someone who understands where I'm coming from. But I'm not even going to influence that person to take up political science, to even run for office if they think, well, you guys don't care about us, no way. So, what's the point? I'm going to go with Exxon and, and Walgreens and, and Walmart and these people because they out there voting. And they out there voting, so if Walmart wants more guns in their store and they're voting along with the NRA, well, you know, I'm going with them. 
Because even though I may enjoy your rhetoric, you're not supporting me. You don't support me, I can't support you. So my view changed. And my view changed to one of balance. Keep praying is very powerful. Keep affirming the truth. Keep seeing yourself better than what you are now. These are truths. But while you do that, and in the meantime while you're doing that, let's vote. So that we can get breaking street. Yeah. <laughs> I'd like to introduce to you the executive director of Rock the Vote, Jamu Green. Thank you very much. I think one day we might see Mayor KRS-One or President KRS-One. That wouldn't be too bad. I want to thank the temple for inviting us to be here, rock the vote and wrap the vote. We go around the country trying to empower young people to participate in the political process. What I want to talk about is political participation. I think I'm preaching to the choir, but how many people voted in the California primary last spring in the room? That looks like about 10 people. So maybe I'm not preaching to the choir. Political participation, as KRS said, is a very, if not the only tangible way that you can make a difference. Politics isn't only about voting, though. It's not only registering to vote and turning out to vote on election day. It's being in this room right now. It's making sure that when there is an issue that you care about, that you are holding the elected officials accountable or being in their face and telling them that they're wrong. It is signing a petition. It is running for office. You can basically rock the vote or wrap the vote every day, but it has to start a big part of it is definitely making sure that you are registered to vote and that you turn out on election day. If you look at the turnout in campaigns these days, I think that um, basically we have a small number of people in this country, and when I say small, 10% at times, and sometimes less, deciding who is going to spend the billions of dollars, who is going to name the streets, who is going to fix the streets, who is going to put the police commissioner in office, and that number year after year is getting smaller, and the politicians are probably really happy about that. My background is in working on campaigns, and there is one thing that you do on a campaign. You focus on how many voters it takes for you to win. Every single campaign wants to understand that small universe that they have to get their message to, and they don't have to pay attention to anyone else. They don't have to pay attention to the 90% of the people who aren't voting in a primary. They don't have to pay attention to the 90% of the people who are paying taxes, who care about their communities, who want to make a difference in their neighborhood. All they care about are the people who actually are going to vote. And the smaller that universe, the easier it is for them. And until we turn that around as a generation, they're going to continue to be happy about it. There are 44 million people between the ages of 18 and 29 in this country. George W. Bush won or lost, however you look at it, with only 50 million votes. This generation has 44 million votes they could contribute to a presidential election. But that doesn't happen. If you look at local races, if you look at it at a smaller level, take it away from the presidential level or at the national level, there are races that a number of people getting together and a difference in 500 votes or 1,000 votes can put a hip-hop mayor into office, can put a member of Congress that is actually going to give a damn about what you want in office. The numbers, the difference in the numbers of races, the small amount of people who are actually registered and who are actually voting, it really is that small. This generation really has the numbers to make a difference. And it's not just about making a difference in what music is listened to, what clothes are popular. The hip-hop generation sets the trends everywhere you look in this country. 
what we could be doing is setting the trend for who is making the de decisions in office, but that doesn't happen. I think KRS mentioned that he didn't advocate voting for a long time. Voting is more, political participation is more than voting. He definitely politicized me, but if you're gonna be someone who is political, who comes to a meeting like this, has a position on a number of different issues, wants to make a difference, and you're not voting, then basically you're wasting your time. So I definitely encourage everyone to register at our table outside if you didn't do that on your way in, but more importantly to vote on November 5th and make sure that you get everyone you know registered and get them to the polls also. Thank you. The British was coming in 1775, but wasn't ready for them thug white boys that ride. Busting a musket, needing they ducats in Holland, fuck them. Went to war with their fathers, uncles, brothers, and cousins. We ain't had dudes in tax and a thug was born. Take what they need and eating whatever they want. Pippin' so long, 400 years about the money. You put a hooker on the block, they put a race out in the country. It's capitalism, cause we capitalize and you get capital punishment if you nickel and dime. Make a killing, sell a million, and you'll live as a legend. Rob a bank for 10 G's and you'll get shot in your chest. Straight through the vests. Big guns hit like big bombs. It's fun to aim at moving targets. Play it on and run. Goals and rules. He who got the gold make rules. And if you break them, you can get shot too. So fuck you. Where you from, boy? I'm a represent. Death, pimp, death. Hustler, that gang's a twist. Lock the block. Down the town. See the sea. This is what my country tears to be. Where you from, boy? Crip go to prison even if he miss you But it was all good banging But I'm blue in the red Blue in the red Today the Johnny came home with a rag on his head rag on Now his it's head. a crisis He's sagging his jeans and rolling dice His ways war on the clubs And now I'm running like mice Move to the bird Made Johnny transfer schools And you still lost your son to them trench coat dudes World is cruel Especially in the land of the free Where you can flip a scrap and ounce a weed for half a G Where you from? I'm a representative Represent. Represent. Yeah. Yeah.
The presentation you are listening to was recorded on September 11th, 2002. It was a memorial to the events of September 11th, 2001. We will now continue our conference with Kumo D, already in progress. I'm on the West Coast. I'm sleeping. It's about 11.30. So that's 2.30 East Coast. I wake up. My answer machine is full. I pick up the phone, and all I hear is, are you watching this? Are you watching TV? Do you see this? Are you okay? Is everybody okay? Do you know anybody? And nobody would leave what actually happened. So the first thing I'm saying is, okay, what are they going to do? How is this going to work? What's going to happen? A couple of days later, after the news coverage inundates us with the visions and the visuals or whatever, I immediately start thinking conspiracy theories, who's behind this, what's really going on, misinformation, disinformation. And then shortly after that, uh, a couple of members in the music industry make the remake the Marvin Gaye record, what's going on, they start calling people. Once again, I don't get a call. KRS doesn't get a call. Chuck D doesn't get a call. There are profound people in hip hop who have lots to contribute, at least from an auditory standpoint, that can say things to inspire, calm, motivate, galvanize, whatever. But what pop culture did was they reached for the hottest artists. We started to pay attention, what's going to happen now, what's going to happen now, I guess something's going to happen. We're going to, for a month, everybody's looking and reaching and searching. We have to have more relevance. We have to have more conscience. Our children, we got to worry, blah, blah, blah. By the new year, it seemed like we were back to the same simplistic, narcissistic, egocentric, uninspired, melancholy, mundane, benign, and vain records once again. And it's almost like most people are taking the position, I couldn't believe one of, one of Bush's positions was, or I don't want to say just Bush, I just say America's position, don't let them win, go out and buy. So because the buildings fell, let's show them they can't win and keep spending money, which doesn't deal with classism, ageism, racism, or sexism. The more profound issues that drive what we, what I call the, st the stagnation of our actual progress. And what happens again, not to say again, I don't want to diss these, these artists, and that's not political, it's because I understand compassionately if your job one is to feed your child, nine times out of ten you're going to do what you have to do to feed your child. And unfortunately, in hip hop, that, or in music, or in arts and entertainment, that seems to have been equated to the less you say, the more money you can make. So almost like an unwritten law, it only takes one bigot at the top of a company for it to be a racist company. Everybody else doesn't have to share any ideology. It's a silent rule. You know what to do and what not to do just by the nature of participating in it. So when the Million Man March happened, when tons of these things happened, everybody wants to do it on the down low. Everybody wants to creep in from the backside and give you the nod and shake the hand, but nobody wants to do it publicly. What I'm getting at also is we have to be able to agree to disagree. We have to be able to put things on the table genuinely, especially when it comes to religion, when it comes to politics, and when it comes to economics. Those, the inequities in our society, racism, sexism, ageism, and classism, affect those three areas of our life so profoundly that we don't even understand the, the less we speak, the less progress we actually make. We don't want to confront the fact that the reality is there's a God concept that actually permeates the thought process that actually motivates or demotivates your action. And because we can't get together, because most people have a very limited understanding of religious doctrine, more or less spiritual, so what happens is your interpretation, you don't want to challenge, oh, well, I'm a Christian, but you know, I don't really read the Bible, but... Uh, Jesus is my Lord and Savior, and uh, that's as far as it goes. They don't want to really, really eloquently start to talk about where these concepts come from, why these concepts are important. And when I look at what happened with bin Laden, to me, that is the ultimate level manifesting on a physical material plane of the lack of communication within a realm of a spiritual ideology concept that has basically had a conflict, I don't want to say since the beginning of time, but for many, many years. So without 
hip hop, which again, you talk about motivating kids, motivating the, the youth. Nobody has the spotlight like hip hop has right now. Nobody can really, really reach the children. If you're talking about galvanizing people to vote or galvanizing people to do anything, it's unfortunate on one level, but it is what it is. Hip hop is the most profound and more prominent art form right now that actually touches youth. So what happens is if we start to put pressure on each other, at least open the dialogue to understand that without us stepping forward and for the hip hop community, especially for those of us that have record labels and those of us that have film companies or whatever, at some point what 9-11 represented is it will hit home eventually. So if you don't do anything in terms of taking a preventative measure and saying KRS made an album called Spiritually Minded, most people didn't even know about it. Once again, in my opinion, and you know, I pay attention to lyrical flows or whatever. I have a book coming, the Greatest 50 MCs. <laughs> and um, it was one of the more, I can't even tell you how many different flows he had, how much eloquent essence he had. It was one of the best lyrical performances that he ever did. But it wasn't known about, A, because it wasn't on a major label. B, it was talking about spirituality, and we seem to shun away from it. And what does that tell you psychologically? Psychologically, we have a God concept that actually warps and stagnates our progress instead of galvanizing us to actually have real genuine respect. Because what happens in religion, in a lot of cases, based on the interpretation of it, not the doctrine itself, the, the interpretation or lack of interpretation, you have people who basically are in a mode of tolerance because it's arrogant to say, I have the truth and you don't. But because you can't be real enough to say that that's what you really feel, you're in a mode of tolerance instead of genuine respect. And if you're truly in a mode of genuine respect, I respect your religious beliefs, we can have a real conversation, which means in the real conversation, we can focus on what the bigger problem is and what the bigger picture is. And once you have that motiv motivating, then you can understand that with any religion, with any doctrine, with any civilization with any race, with any creed, with any sex, once we put the racism, the ageism, and the sexism, and the classism on the table in a real sense, then you'll start to see that once we start having these conversations, then we can start focusing on a bigger picture and start to make moves strategically that do protect us and that do set us up to not have situations like 9-11 happen and we have to sit idly by because what really is going on on a political level is politicians have wars, arguments, and innocent people get killed. The only reason that that's happening is because we don't take ourselves to a level where our voices are really, really manifesting and really, really mattering. So for me, I'm, I'm really uh, let down with the hip hop community on certain levels because we seem to be focusing on one note, how much money we can make, how many records we can sell. And even though that's not the whole landscape of hip hop, it's the more popular point of view. And that's the dominant point of view. And I'm saying for everybody out here, if you can vote you can vote with your dollars. You can vote with your voices. You can vote by picketing. You can vote by your actual participation, but it seems like people don't want to do that until it hits home. And 9-11, more than anything else, was a, a manifestation to show you it will hit home eventually, so we have to start having these conversations, at least taking baby steps to make that uh, an impossibility next time. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Whoa. Talking about the emotional politics of 9 11, let's give a hand to Dr. Dion Bennett. I'm, I'm short. <laughs> Make sure you can hear me. Thank you very much um, for being here, and thank you, Temple of Hip Hop, for inviting me and Nicole, especially for involving me. I'm so thrilled um, to be here today. I'm also thrilled that I'm being called Dr. Dion, although I won't be getting my PhD until the end of the school year. So I like the anticipation of that um, of that event. I'm talking about emotional politics of 9/11 because that's what I study. I study the emotional politics of race in general, especially romantic love. I'm not going to be talking about that today, but I do want to talk about the love that we have for our own voices and how that love has been dishonored, I feel, in the, in the last year and how we have to reclaim that. That's kind of where I'm going with this. Um, I'm going to read some of this. Uh, in 1963, when Malcolm X described the assassination 
of JFK as the chickens coming home to roost. He was almost universally condemned by everyone, including the Nation of Islam, of which he was a member at the time, which officially silenced him. While it is easy to understand why many were offended by what seemed to be insensitivity to what was considered one of the greatest, greatest tragedies in American history, history has also celebrated Malcolm X's willingness to be critical and irreverent at a time when patriotic grief threatened to dull political sensibilities. September 11th is the only event in recent history to rival the assassination of JFK, or some would say MLK, in its emotional impact. And like the Kennedy assassination, it calls for both passionate grieving and a radical reassessment of political realities. The latter, however, this radical reassessment, has not occurred in a meaningful way, although this is a thrilling intervention on that. Um, in many ways, we might consider it a step backwards that so few public figures and none uh, of Malcolm X's stature at that time have accepted responsibility for a meaningful pu public and politicized response to 9-11. This reflects not only an enduring crisis in leadership, of which I think we're all aware um, throughout the nation and all communities, but also the degree to which most of us live in greater terror, and I use that word specifically, of our own government and of the consequences of questioning that government than we have ever or will ever feel towards the religious extremists who are officially described as terrorists. I feel terrorized by my government, I don't know about you. Um, for African Americans, the violent destruction of the black power movement executed by the same FBI that this administration is attempting to over empower did not merely signal the death of a movement, but the death of the political courage, which has never fully been reborn, but which has been echoed more significantly in hip hop culture than in any other area of American cultural life, and I would say any other area of global life. You're it, the hip hop nation is it. You're the living legacy of resistance, and part of what we need to do is, is find ways to honor that legacy through our daily actions. Um, I talk about the emotional politics of 9-11, and when, I'm talk when I say emotional politics, I'm talking about the relationship between power and feeling, or how political and cultural practices affect our emotional lives. Um, immediately after 9-11, most of us struggled with many of the same feelings, shock, grief, fear, rage, love, compassion, etc. Uh, these feelings were meaningful and potent and could have led us in a number of different directions. Instead, those feelings were aggressively and I think ruthlessly manipulated by politicians and the media into what I call pathological patriotism, which is a simple-minded nationalistic surrender to conservative authority and cultural and political ignorance. Even those of us who resisted this manipulation, as I suspect many of us in this room did, were threatened in no uncertain terms with censorship and punishment for questioning pathological patriotism or indeed anything performed by the current administration. Instead of an event that could have opened doors to new ways of thinking about being American, this event was exploited as a mechanism for reducing our complex emotions into, a reactionary, into reactionary nationalist sentiments. And part of what I hope we can do now that we've ha had some distance from that event is to think of new ways to think and feel about 9-11 that are a little more um, productive. Um, one thing that struck me most a year ago is that the greatest American institution that was shattered by 9-11 was not the World Trade Center or the Pentagon. It was the myth of American independence and invincibility. We learned abruptly, violently, and painfully how much we need each other. And I don't mean this in a sentimental, sappy way. Yes, we do need each other emotionally, culturally, and socially. We need to know that people aren't dying all around us. But just as importantly, Americans are not independent people. We are dependent economically, we're dependent politically. We do not run the world, we run with the world. And we need to start acknowledging the fact that we're part of a whole instead of the people who run the whole. And I, I think that that insult to American arrogance <laughs> long overdue. This, this recognition could be a very powerful resource 
for the hip hop community and people of color in particular if we take full advantage of it. One thing that I thought a lot about because I study African American anthropology is how 9-11 has affected African Americans, how it's affected people of color, how it's affected disenfranchised and marginalized um, people. And one of the reasons the, the uh, pathological patriotism has been perpetuated is that we are, we are seduced by the idea of Americans as all being one people. We know that this is a farce, and yet we're compelled by it. I think, I mean, even I'm compelled by it. I remember my sister talking to me on the phone, critiquing the government, critiquing Bush, and I said, well, what are you doing right now? And she was making American cupcakes. So, I mean, these, <laughs> these sentiments are, are, are in perpetual conflict with, within us. Um, I think of this for African Americans when uh, Aaron Magruder's Boondocks cartoon, which led many Americans to drop his car- drop the cartoon, uh, talked about how extraordinary it was for African Americans to have a few days of not being the most hated minority in the country. And I think there was this kind of guilty relief uh, for, for many of us. So on the one hand, uh, we know very well that the celebration of America as a diverse nation is superficial. Um, at the same time, we know that, that we are not anything else, that nobody else has stepped up to claim us, that somehow we have to make sense of what it means to be here. We're, uh, in a sense, a, a, homeless, a homeless people. And this is true also for other groups of people of color. I think it becomes even more intense for African Americans because there's no meaningful sense of homecoming. Um, So kind of what I want to talk about, too, is what does it mean to be an American now, and how can we redefine that instead of submitting to a kind of um, pathological patriotism? It reminds me of W.B. Du Bois' description of double consciousness, which was, he wrote about in 1903, which, but which is even more relevant today, in which he said, one ever feels his sexist language, but we'll forgive him for it, one ever feels his tunis, an, an American and Negro, two souls, two thoughts, two unreconciled strivings, two warring ideals, and one dark body whose dogged strength alone keeps it from being torn asunder. And again, various communities feel this sense of double consciousness. So when we ask ourselves, what does it mean to be American? For those of us who are people of color, we have to struggle with what does it mean to be a person of color in America, even those of us who are not people of color but are politically progressive, what does it mean to be a politically progressive American? So I kind of asked myself, well, how did this affect people of color? How did this affect those of us who are members of the hip-hop community? On the one hand, it affected us the same way it affected everybody else, you know, with all of the emotions that I described earlier. It also renewed for many people a sense of patholo- oh, thank you, a pathological patriotism. Uh, for, for others of us, it made us, and it renewed a sense of cynicism. One of the things that happened to, to many of us that is totally underdocumented is a sense that the only suffering that's considered meaningful or important is the suffering of white Americans. So in fact, for those, those of us who live in disenfranchised communities, we know that members are, of our communities have been dying in numbers that mock the 9-11 numbers. We've been dying of AIDS, of poverty, of violence, of everything that you can think of. And yet when that happens to us, it's not a tragedy. And I think there is a little bit, even though I, th- I think we all felt compassion for the people who died as a result of, uh, of the, the plane crashes, there was a sense of emotional envy that when we suffer in other ways that, that those experiences aren't acknowledged. And that's something that we have to be really conscious of. So one of the things that I noticed as I was kind of preparing for this, I'm going to try to wrap this up, is that most of the, I went to the bookstore and looked at all the magazines, and most of the newspapers and magazines were like, have we changed? How have we changed? How much have we changed? And I guess my response to those kinds of questions is not how we changed or haven't we changed, but to ask, to kind of suggest how we should have changed and did it which is what irritates me (laughs) at this time. So I kind of have a list of things that I think should have changed and that I think we can still change, but we have to be very conscious and aggressive in those those changes. one thing that, ha- that 9-11 did do is it created this rupture. It created a tear in the fabric of American consciousness. And we can take that tear, rip it open, and turn it into something new, but we have to be very assertive about that. So one thing that I thought should have changed was a rigorous questioning of our government's foreign policy and domestic policies and their consequences for us. Instead... 
What did change is that because of pathological patriotism, we recommitted to the outrageous foreign policies. We are possibly on the verge of more egregious violations of the global community through war on Iraq. And so what we, so what I, I suggest we should do now is to be ex even more fastidious in our critiques of the, of the government, more outspoken in terms of voting, as was discussed earlier, in terms of writing to Congress people, et cetera. Another thing that should have changed is a meaningful anti-racist alliance between Arab American communities and other communities of color, I was really disappointed by groups like the NAACP and other groups that didn't take an aggressive stand about the racism being directed towards Arab Americans. And I think we all need to kind of really redirect our energies to letting the Arab American community know that we stand with them in their resistance to racism. Another thing is renewed commitment to civil liberties. I kind of reject the term civil liberties because I think it takes us away from the term civil rights, First Amendment rights, constitutional rights. When we talk about civil liberties, that's what we're talking about. So I think we should have had a renewed commitment to protecting them. Instead, we have the Patriot Bill and other kinds of legislation that are right now in the process of violating civil liberties. There are Arab Americans who are being held indefinitely right now as we speak and we're not we're here and I'm glad we're here but we need to be out there making sure that that isn't happening to people um, I, I, I'm not a I'm out of time. Let me just, a couple of other things. I think we need to, to claim and reclaim the term terrorism. Not just talk about terrorism in terms of what happened with the World Trade Center. To talk about racism as a form of terrorism. To talk about sexism as a form of terrorism. To talk about classism and homophobia as forms of terrorism. And to hold people who practice those things accountable for terrorism and let them be dealt with accordingly. Um, Finally, there, there, there are just a couple of other things that I'm going to skip over. What I would call for, that was, that's, and I think we had the beginnings of this in terms of the compassion and kindness and the sensitivity that we had towards one another, is, is to expand that into a critical kindness, to be able to support one another, to grieve together, but also to challenge each other, to take the kinds of action that are now made possible because of the doubt and confusion that can be organized and, and actualized into more meaningful political action. And I think the hip-hop community is poised more than any other community in the world, absolutely, to make that happen, and to make that happen on individual and community levels, and I hope that's what we'll do. Thank you.